Income tax 2023-2024. Child and dependent care expenses credit overview. Get ready and some coffee because we need to save some money for vacation with the help of income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in publication 503 Child and Dependent Care Expenses Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. We're down in the bottom half of the income tax formula where the credits lie. Remembering that the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement, most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income, here having income minus various deductions resulting in First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts. A must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle. Always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Taxable income, taxable income therefore basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, but is only half the story, half the battle. We still have half the formula to go. We then take that taxable income and calculate the tax based on it. A little bit more complicated than you would think at first because we don't have a flat tax, but rather a progressive tax and multiple progressive tax at that sum income being taxed at rates other than ordinary income, such as the qualified dividends, possibly, possibly long-term capital gains. Then we get to the tax, basically the tax liability, the tax before credits and other taxes. Next, we have the credits and other taxes. Remembering we're focused on the credits, which like deductions are good, but unlike deductions, if you had a dollar credit versus a dollar deduction, you'd basically want the dollar credit usually because a dollar deduction will simply decrease the taxable income, the benefit you get being based on the tax rate and bracket that you are in. Whereas the dollar credit, you would get the full amount of the credit deduction if you had tax liability in order to consume it. That's why it's in the same general area as the other taxes. Other taxes would have a dollar impact, but typically in the increasing of a tax liability direction. The other tax example is going to be the self-employment tax, for example. That gets us to the total tax liability. However, we have not yet stopped or that's not the end of the road because we've already made payments typically with the form of w-2 withholdings or with estimated tax payments so we have the payments that we have to compare to the liability and we also have another category of the credits down here which we would call the refundable type of credits in order to get to the tax refund or tax due so what's the difference between the credits up here, non-refundable credits, credits down here, the refundable credits, the credits up top in the non-refundable area are normal tax type of credits in that they're not going to take the tax liability below zero because if you did, that means it's not a tax anymore. What you have is some kind of welfare or benefit type of program. 
whereas the credits down here in the refundable area may take the tax liability below zero, resulting in a, quote, refund, end quote, that's not really a refund, but rather using the tax code as a type of welfare or benefit type of program. So when we're looking at the child tax credit, the major form is 2441, child and dependent care expenses, not to confuse the child tax credit with other credits that could be associated to children and dependents. So if we have a child, if it's a qualifying child, we might get a child tax credit. And then on top of that, we also might have a earned income tax credit if our income is below a certain threshold and then we could also have the child and dependent care expenses we're focusing this time solely on the child and dependent care expenses that then the form 2441 rolls into this form hopefully you can see the distinctions the dis the difference between these two forms this is the additional credits and uh payments where we have part number one, line two, credits for child and dependent care expenses from form 2441, line 11. And then that's going to be rolling into the form 1040, which starts here. So this is, I'm delineating between the forms. This is the form 1040. We're looking at page number two, tax and credits, rolls into line 20, amount from schedule one, line number eight. All right, so we'll take a look at a software example so we can get a better feel of those forms in future presentations. For now, we want to look at what's new with the credit. Now, if you don't have any idea about the credit, then we'll get into the overview of it. But first, let's touch in basically on what's changing from year to year. So what's new? The temporary special rules for dependent care flexibility spending arrangements, the FSAs have expired. So the temporary special rules under section 214 of the Taxpayer uh, Certainty and Disaster Relief Act of 2020 that allowed employers to amend their dependent care plan to carry forward unused amounts from 2020 and or 2021 to be used as a subsequent year have expired. So when we went through the years that were related to the COVID, the tax code was one of the major tools that were used in order to try to compensate uh, with that situation. So we had a big few years of fluctuation uh, within the tax code. And now we're basically kind of reverting back to what you would think would be the norm again. So for 2023, you may only enter on form 2441 line 13 amounts you carried over from two, uh, 2022 and used in 2023 during the grace period. So see uh, the line 13 instructions for form 2441. Reminders, personal exemption suspended. So for 2023, you can't claim a personal exemption for yourself, your spouse, or your dependents. So, so this is a change that happened a few years ago when they were trying to simplify the tax code. So when you have a dependent, it used to be that you might have gotten a tax benefit of an exemption. They basically tried to simplify things by removing the exemption and then changing things such as increasing the amount of the standard deduction. And then the other benefits you'll typically get is some type of credit that usually being either the child tax credit, the higher of the two credits, and then the other one being the dependent care credit. And then you also could have impacts on the tax rate as well as your filing status, in particular, possibly being able to go with one dependent up from the single status to a head of household. So taxpayer identification number needed for each qualifying person. So just like with the other credits related to children, so we can see that there's tremendous kind of tax benefits oftentimes related to dependents and in particular child dependents because of the child tax credit, the possible earned income tax credit, and then other credits like the uh, dependent care credit. So we have to make sure that they are assigning the person. They need to know who the child is by number and name. 
so that they can identify them and make sure that people aren't double dipping in terms of the benefits for a single child, for example. So you must include on line two of form 2441, child and dependent care expenses, the name and taxpayer identification number, generally the social security number, the SSN that is, of each qualifying person. See taxpayer identification number under who is a qualifying person later. So you may have to pay employment taxes. So if you pay someone to come to your home and care for your dependent or spouse, you may be a uh, household employer uh, who has to pay employment taxes. So this is one of the issues and problems with the tax system in that in certain situations, you end up having a much more complica complicated situation than you would possibly would like having to deal with things like employment taxes, basically the payroll taxes. So just a quick recap, remembering how the tax system basically works. We have an income tax system. The IRS then has the leverage to verify and make sure that people are paying their taxes by the person that is the payer side of any type of transaction. And they have the most leverage in those types of transactions where the payer is a corporation that files taxes, obviously. So for example, if you're a business and you pay an employee, then of course the IRS is going to be wanting you to, as the employer, to report the wages that you pay to the employees to them as well if they can get you to do it, withhold the taxes on the employee's behalf, basically making the employer uh, the government's tax collector. So they've turned the employer into, in essence, a tax collector. We also have complicated the situation a little bit in that we have the self-employment tax uh, as well, which is an another kind of tax calculation that is typically tied to payroll for Social Security and uh, the Medicare uh, situation. Now, if they are not qualified as an employee, then the IRS would still like to force you to report the information and withhold if they could, but they can't generally do that. And so you have to be issuing the 1099 form, not only to the person you paid, but once again to the government so they can double check with the person that received uh, the money in that case. The IRS is typically going to want to to categorize people as an employee employer situation because then they have more leverage forcing the employer to not only give the information on the 1099 about the earnings, but also do the withholdings uh, on the earnings. So if you have someone that's working in your home, then you would think that they're basically kind of like in an employee employer type of situation because you're directing them on what to do basically on a day to day type of basis. And uh, it's not doesn't seem as much to fit in like a contractor type of, of uh, situation. And therefore you would think you might be uh, subject to the payroll having to do uh, with Social Security and Medicare, which also can further complicate things when you're dealing with people possibly in, the, in lower income uh, brackets and possibly with people that have uh, citizenship uh, to, to whether they're gonna be US citizens and whatnot. So in any case, usually you aren't a household employer if the person who cares for your dependent or spouse uh, does so at his or her home or place of business. So obviously, if the person is coming to your home and you're basically instructing them on a day-to-day -day as to what you need done from a day-to-day -day perspective, they're kind of, you're basically acting as an employer in that type of situation. If on the other hand, you're taking the child to their place as more of a daycare or a facility situation, you would think maybe they're acting more as like a contractor uh, type of situation in that case, in which case you would think you would not have to do the whole uh, employer and withholding thing possibly. So C, do you have household employees later? We'll dive into that with more details later. Introduction, this publication explains the tests you must meet to claim the credit for child and dependent care expenses. It explains how to figure and claim the credit. So you may be able to claim the credit if you pay someone to care for your dependent who is under age 13. So now we have an, another age limit here. So remember we saw different age limits when we think about a dependent. When we looked at the dependent questionnaire, we're usually thinking, are they a qualifying child? Because if they're a qualifying child, they might be more likely subject 
to the child tax credit, which has an age dependency uh, related to it, if they're not a qualifying child, then are they still qualifying as a dependent, which has an age, possible age uh, limitation to it? And then, if, and then if they're not a child, do they qualify for a dependent? And then we have similar kind of questions, possibly when looking for the earned income tax credit, because the child possibly could have an, a, an impact on that credit for the lower income thresholds. And then here we have another age limit, uh, the 13, which is a bit lower of an age limit because we're not looking at whether someone possibly is a dependent in this case. We were looking at whether or not they're going to need care by a third party. And the general idea is the IRS is trying to, the idea, the argument for this credit is they're trying to free up people to be able to work, to be more uh, self-sufficient. And in order to do that, they need someone to take care of the child and therefore the benefit of a child tax credit. So you would think that the age limit of the child would be fairly lower possibly so they can't basically take care of themselves at that point. So the credit can be up to 35% of your employment related expenses. To qualify, you must pay these expenses so you or your spouse, if filing jointly, can work or look for work. So that's gonna be the key component. The credit in theory is set up so that it helps people to be able to be self-employed or, or uh, have earned income. And therefore you have the child being taken care of to allow someone to earn income. So this publication also discusses some of the employment tax rules for household employers, dependent care benefits. So if you received any dependent care benefits from your employer during the year, you may be able to exclude all or part of them from your income. So now we're looking at the employer employee situation. You're working for an employer. The employer would like to, of course, pay you as, you know, as much as pot. If they can give you more purchasing power with the money that they're paying you, that will benefit both sides of the equation. If they pay you and the government forces them to take out and pay federal income taxes, social security and Medicare, they're effectively paying you less than if they can pay the same amount on their side and somehow not have it subject to being uh, federal income tax, social security and Medicare. So that, that comes into question with these types of benefits. So if there's a situation possibly where the employer can provide some kind of benefit that has a tax benefit to it so that it's not included in possibly box one of the form 1040 and therefore not subject to the federal income taxes, then they're, pay they're in essence paying you more and that, that gets into the benefits. So you must complete form 2441 part three before you can figure the amount of your credit see dependent care benefits under how to figure the credit later useful items you may want to see related to the credit so we have the publication 501 dependents standard deduction and filing information so obviously this credit has to do with dependents we can see that having a, or a child or dependent typically a child dependent can have multiple impacts that could be quite substantial on the tax return, including the child tax credit, possibly the earned income tax credit. And now we've got the dependent uh, care types of expenses. And therefore you might wanna take a look at whether someone qualifies as a dependent, what's gonna be the impact say on the standard deduction and filing status and you can take a look at the publication on the IRS website, publication 926, Household Employers Tax Guide. So you can, might end up in a situation where you wanna be diving into more detail about this household employer type of situation if you have the caretaking situation of someone that is basically your employee, basically your household uh, employee. What are your obligations then with regards to things like tax withholding, payroll taxes, social security, Medicare, and so on. Uh, form uh, and instructions. So we have the form 2441, child and dependent care expenses. You can find that and instructions, of course, on the IRS website. Schedule H, 
Form 1040, Household Employment Taxes. And then you've got the W-10, that's the Dependent Care Providers Identification and Certification. So this is going to be information you might need to be providing to the IRS if you have a third party taking care of the child so that the IRS is basically verifying, again, kind of who received the money uh, in that type of situation. So clearly, if we're going to give a credit, you can see this from the IRS's perspective, we're going to give you a credit so you can free up your time by allowing someone else to take care of the child. Well, if the person is an employee of you, then we want you to basically rat out the, them in terms of providing us the, the information to possibly have withholdings as though you're the employer employee type of situation. If it's someone else, then we want you still to kind of uh, tell us about them, rat them out in some way, right? By saying this is the child. So we know that the child isn't doubled up with the social security number. And here is the person that we paid uh, for the benefits for this. So you have a similar situation here as an employer employee situation. They have the leverage over the one that's paying. That's you. You're paying someone else for childcare. Normally in these kind of industries, by the way, the government doesn't have as much control over them. For example, hair salons, massage parlors and whatnot. The IRS oftentimes don't like restaurants. They don't like these types of businesses because the people that go to those businesses are individuals and they don't get a deduction. They don't get a deduction for the expenses of getting their hair cut typically. And therefore the IRS doesn't have any leverage on them to rat out the person that they paid to cut their hair because they don't get a deduction for it. Whereas if you're in an industry where you work for another business, then the person that, that paid you does have an obligation to at least issue you a 1099. So, so, and that's, and I still say that in the COVID times, you know, when the government was cracking down on everyone, <laughs> I think they almost enjoyed it, right? They got to crack down on all those businesses they hate that are the cash-based businesses where they, where they're less transparent. They have cash transactions and they can't, and they can't really strangle hold on them, right? In this industry, you would have a similar kind of situation, right? Because you're paying, you're not, it's not really a business situation where you're trying to generate revenue. You're trying to have someone that's just taking care of, of your kids. You don't have a revenue generation thing, but now we have a system, a situation where you're trying to get a tax benefit. Well, if you're trying to get a tax benefit, it's similar to a business trying to get a deduction. And the government of course is going to say, if you want to get that tax benefit, you have to rat out who you paid and which is obviously the institution in this case that was taking care of the child. So again, the, the, the government can possibly go after that institution and make sure that they're paying taxes on their side of the equation if you're going to get a benefit on your side of the equation.